Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to have Judy back at the piano? And it's good to see Melba back there. Anybody else want some recognition there? Uh, just. All right. Uh, announcements uh, will come in a bit. I need to shut up and sit down because we're going to have our call to worship. So let's all stand. we'll go through a few announcements that need to be made. Who has an announcement this morning? Patty? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, two things. We have administrative council meeting October 13th, thank you, <laughs> at 7 p.m. in the fellowship hall. This will be our normal business meeting. I know uh, several of the committees are working on their year-end items and uh, so we'll be wrapping up 2022. And then on October 20th at 6.30 here in the sanctuary, we will have our vote uh, whether we leave the United Methodist Church or stay with the United Methodist Church. Uh, Laura Alton, our district superintendent, will be presiding over that vote and that will be the only thing on the agenda that night is, is that vote. Um, so. If you've got questions, you know, we've done several information sessions. If you still have more questions and want to gain more understanding, uh, please, you know, get with myself, Steve, Christy, or Greg, and we'll try to find you the answers. Also, continue to do your own research. Uh, there's lots of information out there, and we'll be happy to talk through it. But October 20th at 6.30, and we'll be communicating uh, those those dates or that date uh, which also reminds me make sure Margie has your correct 
uh, mailing address, email address, telephone number. Uh, if you're a member of Chandler's Grove, make sure Margie has that correct information because we'll be reaching out to each of you in multiple ways. And um, we'll be reminding you every Sunday as well. So you should have already started seeing, yeah, I did see the email notification. You're, you already started seeing some um, communication on that. So again, make sure Margie has updated information. October 20th will be our vote. Thank you. Any other announcements? Yeah, Carrie. Um, yes, I want to remind you guys one more time that next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4, we're having a baby shower for Erica. <laughs> so I hope everybody can pop in and help us welcome. It's been a while, guys, since we've had a little baby. So we're so excited for you. And just please help welcome this new blessing for us. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mike, in, back here. To confuse you even more with dates, at least some of you. The Finance Committee will be meeting this Thursday at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall to deal with all the stuff we're talking about. Thank you. All right, and the Nominating Committee will be meeting in the office at 7. So, but hopefully those won't cross up. Um, if you have seen the, the forms that have been handed out the past few Sundays. If you wouldn't mind filling those out, let us know what you're interested in. Uh, because as we've all been saying, the nominating committee, administrative council meeting uh, are coming up and that helps us decide like what events and people and committees we need to form for the coming year. So if you'll fill that out, let us know what you're interested in. Uh, any special spiritual gifts you have, let us know, we're happy to take that. And uh, PPR committee, uh, you will be getting uh, some invites from me coming up because we have our annual review, like just our form we have to fill out for, for Steve for the annual year. So Now let's have some fun. We're going to have a yard sale. It's coming, y'all, 10, 11 days right on the, down the line. And it's a good time to come and volunteer and visit and have a good time because it's going to be good weather, I'm sure. And we're just... Yard sale time is always fun and hard work. <laughs> Linda or Joni. Good morning, everyone. We're still talking about our wonderful Jubilee that we hope is going to be a tremendous blessing for our community. Um, our sponsors are going up, over, and beyond. With that being said, if you have not signed up for a T-shirt, Today is the deadline because we've got to get them ordered in time to be here. But the best thing about it is we are now have enough money that you don't have to pay for your t-shirt. Our sponsors have taken care of that for you. So please sign up today because we've got to get them ordered. If you don't sign up today, you will not get one, okay? So don't fuss at us later. <laughs> um, the other thing, if you're real good at chopping, we need volunteers to chop barbecue on Saturday morning. When you look back at our sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall, there is just unbelievably no one has signed up to chop barbecue. <laughs> None. Everything else is filling up, but no barbecue. And we also need people to volunteer to help us with the trash, because one thing we don't want is our church yards to be covered in litter the day of our event. So we expect everyone to help, and we, look, we just thank everybody for all the prayers, all the support. It's going great, right, Greg? Anyone else? Sounds like you don't have enough to do. So if you have nothing tomorrow night to do, <laughs> come over to the Lineberry Church and listen to our Pastor Steve and the choir who are all supporting that little church as they try to find their way according to God's will. Seven. It is tomorrow night. Thank you, Linda, for reminding me I'm preaching tomorrow night. So, uh, <laughs> appreciate that little heads up there. Yeah. Any other? Uh, <laughs> any other announcement? 
I'm going to step out in faith and say, I'll purchase one of those T-shirts. <laughs> all right, if there are no other announcements, let's all stand and greet one another and tell everybody it's good to have you in church this morning. Our first hymn this morning is Lord Speak to Me, and Judy's going to play it through one time so you can hear it in case you're not familiar with it. he will pray for the rest of our worship service. Good morning, everyone. It's certainly good to see us safe and sound after the ravages of Hurricane Ian. Let's Ian. not forget to thank first responders for the courage and the willingness to carry out their duties to keep the rest of us safe. And certainly we felt it right here at, uh, in this community. Bow your heads with me and let's have our prayer. 
God, we feel so blessed to be in the presence of the other disciples on this Holy Sabbath day. Be with Pastor Steve as he brings us a message of hope and salvation. And let our Christian lights shine ever so brightly, not only this day, but in all of our coming days. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I know that we all have people that we are concerned about, and, and the Lord has blessed us also, and we'd like to share those blessings. I want to thank all of you that made that effort to come out for our revival last weekend for Sunday, Monday, and uh, Tuesday night. I thought it went very well, but I'm a little prejudiced, I guess, but uh, I did. I thought it went very well, so um, anyway, thank you guys for being faithful. Uh, for that revival and our choir for being faithful and uh, all those that participated you know playing the piano and you know the special music throughout uh, those three days I'm grateful to all these people Pete for running the sound and uh, you know it's just a it's a group and a team effort whenever you do something like that and so I appreciate all those faithful people doing those good things uh, for the kingdom of God um, I want to thank the Lord that he watched over us over the storm the other night. Got a little hairy uh, there a few times through the evening, but, you know, I was thinking to myself during that time how difficult it must be right now for the people down in South Florida and that, that area. They've just been ravaged. Uh, um, you know, those storms are very, very difficult to to live in and through. And if you've ever been through a hurricane, uh, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's a very, very hard time for everybody. Let's keep praying. This is gonna be a long effort. Uh, right now, they're still going through that triage period in the whole state of Florida. Uh, but the, there are gonna be those that have adequate insurance. There are gonna be those that don't. And so we have a lot of volunteers that go in to those uh, regions. Uh, I know I've worked about five hurricanes where I, I realized that there are so many people that didn't have an adequate uh, insurance. And, uh, and so they were, were, they were totally dependent on volunteers that would come and do the good work. People like Samaritan's Purse uh, and also uh, the United Methodist Church, we've always been really good about our disaster response. So uh, Let's just keep all those people uh, for this long journey that's ahead of them uh, to help people rebuild their lives uh, in a very difficult time. So do you have any other prayer requests this morning? Uh, anyone specific you want to lift up in prayer? Raise your hand. Every, whoever, I saw a hand. No, I It's on. My cousin Jack Ferrier is having lots of troubles. Okay. Some of you probably remember Phyllis, my friend who has been here numerous times. She fell in her backyard, broke her arm in two places, and they're waiting to see if she has to have surgery. So prayers for her. She's in some discomfort right now. Yes, home. I'd like to ask prayers for my cousin Ken Bowers. He is really sick right now. Um, he called me last night or texted me last night, and he had a fever of 104. <laughs> Don't know what's going on. Tested negative for COVID. But just keep him in your prayers. And also, my friend Wanda Cruz. She just got out of the hospital, and they thought she had had a heart attack. So just keep her in your prayers, also. Thank you. Right, prayers for. There it goes. Prayers for my Aunt Charlene. She was in Florida and um, had to be airboated um, out because it was um, so underwater to the hospital. for uh, She couldn't breathe and was having heart issues. I, I still haven't heard the results. And her grandson lost his house. And again, no insurance for, right. for him. So please keep them in your prayers. Yes. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their prayers. Keith's surgery went great, 
and he's in rehab now for a week. So. Okay, good, good. Can I please pray for my niece, uh, Rebecca Kaler? She was diagnosed with cancer this week. Oh, okay, we will. Uh, here, then. I'd like, like for you to uh, pray for a friend of mine, Rick Moore. Uh, he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer this week. Okay. And also, like to thank everyone for the prayers and support this church has shown Penny and I. We really do appreciate it. And keep Penny in your prayers. Uh, she's still in a lot of pain. Yeah, God bless her. And it's good to see you up and moving after that surgery. Um, I'd like to ask prayers for um, Bob Rowe, my friend Sharon uh, at work, her husband that fell. Um, they've got his lung fixed, but one of the ribs are close to his liver. Um, and in two weeks, they want to do uh, surgery for that, but they want him to get his strength back. So for two weeks, he's going to be um, at the nursing home in Albemarle for rehab. So just keep them both in your prayers. I want to remember the family of Archie Emery. Um, he passed away this past Sunday. And uh, for their family who was dealing with the loss of a father. I'd like to have a prayer for my good friend back home and uh, a schoolmate and a friend for life. Uh, her, she has a problem with the bladder cancer now. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask prayers for um, Marlene Bissett, um, pancreatic cancer diagnosis, few weeks to live. She's about my age. Um, her family is uh, this weekend uh, celebrated Thanksgiving, and um, tomorrow they're decorating for Christmas because. She has very limited time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Let us con continue to, uh, to pray for all those who have been sick, those that are grieving, uh, those that are recovering from uh, uh, issues in their own life, you know, whether they be physical or spiritual or mental. Um, I'd like to also pray for a friend of mine in Virginia. His name's Steve Crocker who has uh, got the COVID virus, and let's be in prayer for Steve. Anyone else? All right, let's all spend some time and let's pray to our Lord. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks that we can come as believers and bring before you these people, these requests, Lord, you never, you, you never ever let us go. You're always very present in our life. We are in times of, of hardship, Lord, you are there. In times of uncertainty, you are there. In times where our body is broken, you are there. Lord, you are very present with us, and we're grateful beyond our words to express uh, how much we love you and how much we are grateful that you love us. We pray, O oh Lord, for our nation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that those who lead will be filled with the Spirit of the, of the Holy Spirit and one that uh, is seeking peace, one that is always uh, looking to build up and not tear down. We pray, O oh Lord, for our churches all throughout the land, all denominations of all faiths, O oh God, that we can all hear your voice, that we'll listen to your Holy Spirit instead of impose our spirit uh, in the areas of, of the church and, and how we are to be in a world that is desperately in need of a message of hope and a message of salvation. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks this morning that we have a, a church family that we can come to where we're welcomed and it is a genuine welcome where people care for one another. And Lord, where we have opportunity to reach out to those in our community that you have put us in charge 
of being that light into the lives of people that are struggling with the issues that they're facing in their families and in their life. Lord, I thank you for the missions of our church, and I thank you for the vision of the future of our church. Guide our steps that we can be a faithful body of believers and that we will always turn to your word to guide us in our understanding, to teach us what it means to live as a Christian. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. We pray, Holy Spirit, that your presence will teach us this morning, that you will open our hearts and our minds to your word, that you'll instruct us in our path, that you will inspire us and bring our our hearts closer to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. At this time, I'd like to ask our ushers if they would come forward and receive his tithes and our offerings this morning. Lord, as we give our offerings today, we just thank you for the many blessings that are overflowing in our life by you and the power of your spirit. You have saved us. You have given us hope. You have given us eternal life. You have never stopped loving us, and you have pursued us, and you brought us into a place of, of, of life eternal. And we give you thanks. This meager offering is just a small symbol of a greater, greater gift. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
It is now, right? Good. This morning's scripture comes out of 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read through verses 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge of the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from the listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, Always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I am ready, I'm already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 
From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And so is the reading of God's holy words. You know, if we could all sort of write down before we die words to encourage our family or our friends, what would we write? I have read some of those testimonials of people that were dying. I remember a a pianist I had uh, back in Canton, North Carolina, uh, in which actually she was our organist. And uh, she was a really wonderful person. Uh, Her name was Linda Williamson. And I remember that when Linda, who was very in control of things and and a very disciplined lady, a very kind lady, uh, quiet but yet very gifted and very devoted, and she found out that she had cancer. And as we all know this story, uh, in some cases, the cancer just ravaged her and overtook her. And I remember driving down to Durham to see her at Duke Hospital uh, only uh, probably a week or two before she passed and went on to glory. And I went in, she told me to bring uh, a pencil and a pad with me. And so I drove down and went to her room and sat there and she asked everybody that was in there, please leave uh, and, and said, I wanna speak to my minister. And so everyone left the room and there I sat and she said, Steve, I have written down a few words that I want read first thing at my funeral. And then I have a few other things I want you to write them down. And after that, then you can say whatever you wish. And so we went through that routine and she rewrote the 23rd Psalm in the first person and which she uh, was sharing her faith and how she uh, had always depended on God throughout her life. She wanted her family, some who knew Jesus, some who didn't, to hear those words. And then a few other personal things of her faith and which I shared with the the people a couple of weeks later. But you know, it was a beautiful way to to sort of have a a remembering service of of a memorial for another person. She was well loved and, and very kind She had one of the most peaceful deaths I think I've ever sat by a bedside and seen because they're not always easy. You know, they're very hard and it's not always peaceful, uh, you know, physically. But she just sort of just slipped away into a quiet uh, breathing and uh, and just closed her eyes and went to sleep. And, And, you know, it was just perfect. It was like the perfect death, you know, that we all sort of, you know, when people talk about dying, they say, well, I want to just, I want to go to bed one night and and just go to sleep and go to heaven. You know, that that seems to be everybody's number one wish to die is to go to sleep and go to heaven. Well, she got that. You know, what would you say? What would you say to your family, to your church, to those that you love and care about if you were facing certain death? And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the Apostle Paul who had traveled three missionary journeys, been shipwrecked, been put in prison, been beaten, been threatened. He had gone all over Asia Minor preaching the words. You know, if you even look at the uh, topography topography of, of the country of Turkey, you will see that Turkey has a lot of high mountains and when they have retracked his walking, of the Apostle Paul, he had to climb mountains to get from one place to another. It wasn't just this smooth little path that he could ride a horse. No, these were places he was physically walking into hostile territory of people who had never heard a gospel message in their life because it was non-existent. It's not like going to other places uh, throughout the world where there is a, a certain amount of people that are, are Christians. There were no Christians. The church was brand new, and so he had given his life, his life that had been threatened, 
He had been uh, rescued. He had been beaten down, imprisoned, and yet he stayed the course no matter how difficult it got. And he used his life experience uh, in his teaching as the Holy Spirit of God. And maybe that's why the Holy Spirit chose him to be the, uh, the, the writer of all these epistles, which takes up a third of the New Testament or writings of Paul. And so it's his life is a testimony of the early church and the things that we will always have to go through no matter what age we're in. So we have this doctrine now uh, of, um, of there are those who believe and they're teaching in the churches that the scriptures are not relevant anymore in the life of the church. That the scriptures really are narratives and metaphors that we use that we have to to bring them, evolve them into the culture of which we are living. And it seems like they're far more concerned about pleasing the culture than teaching the truth to the church. So whenever you get up on Sunday morning and you get ready and you get dressed and you drive down to the church house, you're coming down here, what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear truth? Or do you want to hear my interpretation of truth? And see, this is a battle that Paul recognized was coming. And he is speaking to Timothy. It's like his protege. He, he, was, he loved Timothy greatly. And he's speaking to him in this, in this passage trying to, to encourage him that when I'm gone and I'm no longer there, Timothy, these are some things I want you to remember. And so Timothy uh, would then go forth and minister in his absence until his day would come to end. He was wanting to remind Timothy to remember to proclaim the message, message and to be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Part of our life as a Christian, my friends, is being persistent whether the time is fitting or the time is not. I can't tell you how many missed opportunities we as Christians have had because we felt the time was unfavorable. And so we sort of just gave in and gave up. And, you know, and if you think about that, that would be like if somebody is standing on the edge of a cliff and you know if they take one step more backward, they're going to fall off. But yet, even though you see the urgency of the hour and it's maybe not the most ideal time maybe you got other people around this one pulling you that way uh, you have to be over here later I have to do this and all well maybe I'll just next time I see them there may not be a next time because this person's one step away from death now if we had that kind of an urgency in our spirit in our soul and a persistence to be faithful whether the season is ripe or whether it's not, whether it's stormy or whether the clouds have passed and the sun comes out. If we are willing to be faithful in all circumstances is what he's trying to tell Timothy. Take that opportunity. Don't let those times pass. Because have you ever thought that maybe, just maybe, that was a divine appointment that God it put you there at that one particular time when that person had one, they were one step away from life and death that you were the one he put there? Now he never said it was going to be easy. He's going to say, you're going to have to trust me. But if you walk away, you may never know whatever happened to that person. Things like that haunt me. Because I think of my missed opportunities, or my sins of omission, more, more than my sins of commission. It's these sins of which I omitted in my life. Sins where I purposely created a scenario that I did not want to get involved. I wasn't feeling it that day. Oh, wow. Poor me. Think about that. How selfish is that? 
He wants Timothy to stay the course. There are times Paul knew in his own personal life it's going to be favorable, and there's other times it's not going to be good. I know. I have been in situations in both camps. And Timothy, it will happen to you too. And then what he goes on, he says, convince, rebuke, and encourage with utmost patience in teaching. You know, there are, I know we have this discussion about what has God called me to, what am I called to be. I want to talk to the teachers in here. All of you that have taught Sunday school or Bible studies, or God has given you the gift to be able to speak or teach, do you realize the responsibility, I, I hope you do, of what you have when God puts you in a place like that? No, it's an honor to be called, but let me tell you, whenever you get up to speak to people and to teach them, how important is it that you speak the truth? Unfortunately, right now, we have a battle on this word truth. In our society today, we sort of all want to have our own little truth. You know, well, your truth is not my truth, and so, you know, none is really right and none is really wrong. I'm right for myself. What a narcissistic way of looking at faith. I'm right with my own self. I'm good. Like I've said before to you, there's these people when you ask them, how's your spiritual life? And I ask that question all the time. Oh, God and I, we're tight. We're good. We're in good shape. Yeah, we're buds. I go out in the woods and I worship God with the squirrels and the rabbits. Yeah, God and I, we're in, we're in good shape. And I, and I just want to say, are you trying to convince me or, or convince yourself? Or we have this sort of open-ended truth where we're frightened to death to speak truth. This is one of the problems that we have is that we're afraid to speak out on the truth. Now people say, well, preacher, who gives you the, uh, the license to tell people what is the truth? I'm going to point to the book. Amen. That is what gives us that license to speak the truth. See, whenever we teach, you are dealing more with, not just with a person's mind, but you're dealing with their souls. The truth is supposed to teach and reveal something. Preaching is to exhort or to warn about what they've been taught. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? And so whenever we're teaching, so preaching and teaching sort of are closely aligned. You know, if you go and say, thou shalt not, da, 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 da. And then you have the scripture for it. Then I come in here and I say, hey, folks, beware. Somebody just taught you that if you take one more step backwards, you're going to fall off a cliff. I'm here to warn you, don't take another step. Yeah, it's probably maybe because i got a loud voice. I'm always told i got a loud voice. It carries very well. Uh, but I, I don't know. How many in here cannot hear me when I speak? <laughs> How many would like not to hear me when I speak? <laughs> yeah, see, those are two different questions, aren't they? All right. What's the truth here? In James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Did you know that, teacher? Did you know that what you're teaching, you are going to be judged with greater strictness than those who are sitting and learning? That's right. Did you hear that? I want you to sort of let that soak in a little bit. We're held accountable for what we tell people. So Paul is charging Timothy. You know, my, one of my favorite Wesley hymns is a charge to keep I have. It always stirs my heart. It's a personal thing with me and my calling. It is whenever we are charged, we are provoked to be or to do. 
We are called out to do something. And when the Almighty God provokes my spirit and calls me to do something, you know, and I hear it very clearly, I have two choices, I will or I won't. There's not a third choice. God's not up for negotiation here. We love to compromise, don't we? We want to compromise our faith. We want to compromise our belief. We want to compromise everything just to keep the peace. But you know, sometimes the truth is inconvenient to our compromise. Sometimes it is just what it is. And God did not ask our opinion. He did not ask my opinion. He hasn't asked your opinion. He is telling us. Why? Because He loves us. He sees us standing next to a cliff, and if we take one more step, we're going to fall off the mountain. And so He's going to tell us the truth. He's not going to say, well, you might fall off the mountain. Or maybe the fall won't be so bad on the way down. Maybe you'll survive. You won't walk again, but you might survive. You know, that's what we do all the time. We're all the time trying to rationalize bad behavior. We're always trying to convince everybody, yeah, but I love these people. Well, of course you do. You know the cliche, you love the sinner, but not the sin? I know we, a lot of people use that a lot, almost to nauseam. But that is true. So, Paul telling Timothy, He's saying, Timothy, I want you to set the standard high by using the Word of God, what, what you have been taught. The Holy Spirit is given to me, and I'm giving it to you. Preach the Word, he said. We need to preach the Word. Preaching the Word is something that's important. Some people say, well, that's really not a job. I don't understand that. I love it when people say, boy, I love your job, preacher. You only work one hour a week. <laughs> you know? Preach. Let's see in history, who were some of our best preachers? Jesus. He preached. John the Baptist preached. The Apostle Paul preached. Peter preached. James preached. They weren't just teaching, they were preaching. They were standing up in front of big crowds of people and they were preaching truth. And whenever you preach, you are to be ready always, as I'd always said, whether the season is, is ripe or whether it's not. Whether it's something you're comfortable with or not. God will give us opportunities if we choose it and to watch faithfully to, to be obedient to it. In preaching, we are to reprove, convict, and expose. That's not very comfortable, by the way. Did you know that? Whenever you rebuke or you reprove people, that is not comfortable to do. It's no more comfortable to do than it is to receive. I, I've never liked being under conviction. I don't enjoy being under conviction. How many enjoy being under conviction? Nobody does. How important is conviction in our life? Very. It's extremely important. Whenever we hear the Word of God and we hear the Spirit of God speak to our hearts, the Lord. and then we say, well, Lord, I'm not living like that. But what we end up doing is backpedaling because we're trying to hold on to our own truth. And with our own truth, we start to make compromises. We're all the time trying to recreate what is true into our image. In fact, we are more telling God what to do than God telling us what to do. That's what we do. And this is the dilemma that the church is in today. We have far too many people claiming to be the voice of God when all it is is their voice. And so they're telling people things that are untrue. They're leading people away from God. And just like I, I had I read to you earlier, you know, we're going to answer to this. So all of these who are false prophets in this world who claim to be such wonderfully justified.
God, filled in the Spirit, blood-washed Christian. And they're up there just drawing people by the thousands so they can fleece them for money. And they do it in the name of Jesus. That should scare you to death. You're going to be held accountable. You're going to answer. If you're telling somebody that sin cannot destroy your soul, you're lying to them. You're not speaking truth. Paul tells us to speak the truth in love a little bit later. No one enjoys being rebuked. No one enjoys being spoken to about truth. But it's necessary. And how do you find the truth? I just, I'm not going to make it up as I go along, folks. I'm, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to the book. Because in the book, it is inspired word of God. And I really believe that our great issue today is that we are not following the authority of Scripture. Amen. We're not doing it. We're recreating the Bible. We have Americanized the Bible. We have Americanized our, our, our whole religion. It has become a civil religion. Are we putting our trust in Him in heaven or putting our trust in people on this earth? Shame on us. Shame on us for putting our faith in politicians. We are Christians. We are followers of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. And we are to heed His call. Amen. Listen to His voice, whether it's in season or out of season, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's difficult or easy. There is only one who has saved you or saved me and have given us a hope. Not as the world gives. The world is hopeless. The true hope that we hold on to in our lives that we can write these words down, inspired by the Spirit, that Paul was able to write down, he, faced, he was going to be beheaded very soon. His head was going to be removed from his body. And that was an honorable death to Romans. Did you know that? That was his future on this earth. But yet... He stayed the course in his faith. He trusted the only one that came to set him free of sin and death. He knew that there was some future glory waiting for him. He knew it. He didn't create it out of his truth. He believed it because the Holy Spirit of God and Jesus Christ revealed it to him. And Jesus promised it to him. We can, we can rely on what the Scriptures teach us, folks. Fear not. They're true. Amen. And there are times it's not convenient. There are times they really push us. There are times they convict us. Praise God they convict us. Amen. Because they stop us from growing weary. Because one of the things he told uh, Timothy was rebuke will mean stern war uh, with a stern warning in your life, but also exhort. And what does it mean to exhort? It means to encourage that people don't grow weary. Because the truth, my friends, will set you free. Amen. And you will not be a slave to this world and a slave to politics and a slave to money, and a slave to things, and a slave to your own devices, yes, sir. and a slave to your own sin and your own pride. Because all those things are going to destroy your soul. But you can be set free because Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to die on a cross 
to set us free. To forgive us. Let me tell you a little nugget of, of information. When he died on that cross that day, he forgave you for all your sins. That's right. Our, our, our course in life now is to say, Lord, I thank you for the gift, and now I want to serve you the rest of my life. Yes. And whatever way you... If you want me to sweep floors, I'll sweep them with Jesus on my heart. If you want me to take out trash, I'll sing Amazing Grace at the dump. Whatever you call me to do is not below me or above me. Oh, Lord, I, am, I just want to be a faithful servant of God. I want to live a life that is pleasing to you first. And I've got to get myself out of the way. My old bad self is not getting it right. I'm not, I don't really have the answers, I'll be honest. And if I'm making up the answers as I go along, holy cow, is that dangerous? That is dangerous. The Apostle Paul facing death is speaking truth to his dear friend. He said, for the time is coming. In fact, it is here. People will have itching ears that are pleasing to them. They will, they will seek out people that will tell them what they want to hear. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? They're going to seek out those that will tell them what they want to hear. Let me tell you, I would suggest, it's just a friendly nudge, from minister to his congregation, if you want to know the will of God, look in the Bible and stop listening to Oprah Winfrey. It's just, it's just a, it's a little nudge. That's all I'm saying. Nothing against her. But if I'm going to go and try to find the truth of God's word and what Jesus' revelation is for my life, I'm going here. Unfortunately, we have way too many leaders that are saying one thing and doing another. They're nothing more than whitewashed tombs. They look like holy people and sound like holy people, but they're speaking untruth in the lives of the people in the church, and then they wonder why the church is in a mess that is in. Kill the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Our shepherds need to be faithful to God first, above you. If you have itching ears, and if you're just, if I'm here just because you want the way I speak, which is really hard for me to figure that one out, <laughs> then shame on me if all I do is look at my profession as a profession and not as a calling. Because there are times when God calls you to speak the truth and tell it the way it is and so that the, the sheep will not scatter. Hey, thank you. Now you've got to be careful not to become arrogant. You've got to be careful that you're listening to the Spirit of God and not to your own opinion. I don't think you want my opinion. But I do believe you are hungry for what God thinks. We have far too many today that are going around trying to please our world. We're trying to live in two places at one time. We're calling ourselves a Christian here, and that yet we have our foot in the door of the world here. And they're our leaders. We're deceiving people. We're telling them what they want to hear so we can get that paycheck. It is profession, not a calling. That's a dangerous territory to be walking because you are taking a responsibility for the souls of all those people that are believing every word you say. And if you're lying to them or telling them your truth or what is the relevant truth of the day, which can change in 10 years to another relevant truth of the day, and it's always shifting sand, it never sits still, so no one really has what the truth is. We must dive into his word and be faithful to trust him. Please, I ask you, friends, I know it's repetitious. I know you're tired of hearing it probably. 
Get your nose in the book. Please. I ask you, take time to read the Word. Because no matter how willing you are to fight the good fight, it's going to be hard to fight that fight if you don't know what you're talking about. Please, for your own sake. People will turn away from the truth, the Bible says, and wander away. We're seeing this happen right in front of us. All throughout, we're seeing this happen. The Bible is speaking the truth to us. Paul to Timothy, he says, Be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. In other other words, finish the work that was given to you. And when you finish the work that God has called you to do, then it will be time for you to exit and move on to glory. We all have a calling in our life. Find out what that is and be faithful. And trust Him for all the rest. I promise you, our Lord is not our enemy. The enemy is trying to pull us away from Him. Stay grounded in your faith. You've got to in these days that we live on this earth. All right, I'm going to finish right now. I love the way Paul finishes this. How many times have people used this? As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. Do you long for His appearing, church? I think a lot of us are longing for that. We long for the appearing of our Lord to return. We no longer fear it. We we are longing for it. We're longing for it. We're saying, Lord, come quickly. Jesus, come quickly. Let's all pray. Gracious and loving God, as we are trying to run the race and keep the faith, stay in the course in our life, being faithful in our calling, O Lord, our souls do long for you. You are the one who has come to love us and save us from death. You and you alone are the way and the truth and the life. It is through you that we have hope, not as the world defines hope, but as you give hope and truth. Lord, fill our church with a hunger and our, ho- and our spirits by the power of your Holy Spirit to be faithful till you call us home. I pray for all that are here today that you just speak to their hearts and that they will answer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our closing hymn. Seven hundred and twenty three. Shall we gather at the river? Let's all stand and sing.
My dear friends, I want to encourage you to go forth from this church building today. And as you face a new week, find your Bible, open it up, and spend some time this week reading it. Spend time in the Lord in prayer, and then be faithful to serve Him where He calls you to serve Him. You'll do those three things. I promise you, it will please Him. And until we meet again, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.